Many people have sought to understand why young people don't turn out to vote in bigger numbers. Here's a scary thought. What if it's because they don't really believe in democracy? New research suggests that might be closer to the truth than most of us would care to admit, and points to a rising interest in authoritarianism among some young people. Here to help us understand what's going on, let's welcome, in London, England, former Deputy Head of Policy at Number 10 Downing Street, Will Tanner, who's now Director of the UK think tank Onward. In Oxford, UK, Yasha Monk, Professor at Johns Hopkins University and author of The Great Experiment, Why Diverse Democracies Fall Apart and How They Can Endure. In Montreal, Quebec, Dietlin Stola, Professor of Political Science at McGill University and former Director of the Center for the Study of Democratic Citizenship. And here in our studio, Samantha Roche, Executive Director of the youth-led nonprofit group, Apathy is Boring. Okay, great to have everybody on the program today. And I want to start by just sharing some of the numbers that come out of Will Tanner's recent report out of the United Kingdom. More than a quarter of 18 to 34 year olds in the UK think democracy is a bad way of governing the country. That is three times higher than the share of those over age 55. 61% agree that, quote, having a strong leader who does not have to bother with parliament and elections would be a good way of governing this country. That number's doubled since 1999. 46% agree that, quote, having the army rule would be a good way of governing the country. That's a five-fold increase since 1999. Here's Canadian youth views on democracy from those age 18 to 29. Only 39% in that age category strongly agree with the statement, democracy may have its problems, but it's better than any other form of government. That compares to 74% of those 60 and over. 49%, half of young people surveyed, are neutral on the question. 21% of young Canadians agree that it doesn't matter whether a government is democratic or non-democratic. 12% agree that under some circumstances, an authoritarian government may be preferable to a democratic one. That is twice the proportion of those over age 60 who would say this. Uh, and I guess we should note, in Canada, these numbers have remained relatively stable over the past few years when compared to other countries. That may suggest less of a trend towards more anti-democratic views among youth. One more graphic here. In the United States, their views on democracy among youth, age 18 to 29. 52%, roughly half, of young Americans consider their democracy to be in trouble or failing. 13% of them don't know whether it's important that America is a democracy. 7% say either not very or not important at all. Those are the gory details. Yasha, you first. How worried are you about all this? Well, I'm very concerned. Um, my colleague Roberto Foro and I uh, looked at very similar data uh, seven or eight years ago um, to make the case that democracy in countries like the United States could come to be in trouble. This was at a time when people assumed but it was kind of strange and kooky to talk about potential threats to American democracy. What I learned in graduate school was that uh, democratic institutions in rich countries that had had uh, democratic elections for a very long time were completely certain. And it turned out to be a very good lead indicator because a couple of years later, we got the election of Donald Trump, his attacks on the democratic system, and ultimately the assault on the Capitol on the 6th of January. 2021. So what we're seeing here is asking some of those same questions again five or six years later, uh, things have actually gotten worse uh, than they were at that point. And I think that just shows us the extent to which young people believe that the system is not delivering for them, um, are skeptical about the extent to which uh, uh, things are working for them and the system is going to deliver for them in the future. Uh, and that is uh, as, as bright a warning sign as it was when we looked at that data originally a number of years ago. Will Tanner, what do the numbers say to you? Well, I too am deeply concerned. And I think what's interesting about this data and this report in particular is the extent to which, um, whereas previously we thought that the threat to democracy might be geographic in the sense that it was uh, particular parts of the country. You might think of the Rust Belt in America. You might think of the Red Wall in the UK where uh, voters are particularly disenfranchised or feel disenchanted with uh, the status quo in terms of the government of the country. Um, we saw that with Brexit. We saw that to some degree with Donald Trump. Actually, this data suggests that um, 
the problem may be generational, that there is a, a number of age cohorts, particularly the 18 to 35 year old cohort, who have grown up in a period where actually democracy was not under threat internationally. There was not a kind of big battle for democracy versus uh, other forms of government uh, around the world uh, and authoritarianism in particular, where democracy perhaps hasn't delivered for them, as, uh, as Yasha says. Uh, and they have actually not really been sold on the benefits of democracy. And I think the long run effects of that in terms of uh, the health of our democracies in, in the long term uh, is profoundly worrying, actually. It could lead to uh, a return for authoritarian forms of government. And I, I would say that that could happen on the left or the right. I'm not sure this is specifically a right wing versus uh, left wing threat. I think it could happen across the political spectrum. Professor Stoller, let me put the uh, accent on Canada as I bring you into the conversation. We like to think in Canada that we are uh, enjoying one of the saner democracies in this world. Uh, and I wonder whether you think we are somehow able to avoid uh, much of the numbers that we have uh, presented so far. I thought so too. In fact, uh, I was uh, kind of skeptical when Yasha came out with his report a few years ago. No offense, Yasha. Uh, and uh, we thought that uh, young people really participate, for example, very differently in politics. Uh, and uh, a lot of measures don't capture that. So we need to look at this very differently. So we also thought that maybe uh, when we also measure the support for democracy, we, we cannot ask the normal survey questions about an abstract concept. Um, and so we uh, actually established some survey questions that dig more into what really makes democracy work. Uh, so, for example, uh, we ask whether it's okay if a political leader takes away the checks uh, from uh, the executive, for example, in terms of media control or parliamentary contributions and judiciary uh, limitations. And uh, we thought that young people would not agree with this. We also thought that young people uh, would not agree uh, with some uh, freedoms that can be removed. Um, and uh, what we found in our research, including in experiments, is that young people in particular uh, are more laissez-faire about these issues and uh, don't care as much when undemocratic politicians act. And that is worrisome to us. And it also happens in Canada as well as in the US. And we also see a similar trend in European countries. Sam, I have purposely left you for the end <laughs> so that you could hear what everybody else had to say first. And also because I presume you're in the age demographic that we are talking about here. And I want you to tell somebody who's of my generation why I ought not to be utterly mortified at these numbers. <laughs> I mean, I think we should all be utterly mortified by these numbers. I don't think that that's something that young people um, or, or different generational cohorts, um, you know, should should feel differently about. I think what's what we're seeing here is one. I think youth can be a leading indicator in a lot of ways. When you have young people who are very concerned about their financial futures, very concerned by the idea that their government isn't working for them. And we have known that they felt that way for a long time. The research that we do into barriers to why people don't vote or participate in elections, for example. Young people have been saying for years, I don't like politicians, they don't speak for me, they don't speak to me, and they're all the same, and it doesn't make a difference whether I vote or not. Older people think that too. Yes. But they don't question democracy as a result right. of it. They question the politicians in I, question. I think that the outcomes of that over time have built these narratives around, especially when you add into the mix, really urgent problems that we're facing that are time bound. So climate change, for example, young people feel very strongly that we need to act urgently and now. And we even have international bodies saying now that the governments of Western democracies are like sleepwalking towards climate disaster. And the stress of that that young people feel, I think they're looking for decisive action on these issues. And I don't think they feel their governments are responding quickly enough in the way that they would like hmm. them to. Yasha Monk, you're, I mean, you're around young people all the time, given your perch at Johns Hopkins. Do you, do you think young people don't understand what democracy actually is? Uh, no, I think they understand the basics of the democratic system. At least my students do. I make sure of that. Um, I do think, though, that part of this is something that Steve, you and I, as people who are in the media, should be somewhat self-critical about, because I think sometimes we are capable of focusing so much on the negative aspects of our society, so much on the things that aren't working, uh, that we forget about some of the things that are working. Now, look, 
it's natural to be angry about the injustices in our society. It's natural to be angry about uh, living standards not going up. It's angry. It's natural to focus on those negative aspects. But I think when the narrative so exclusively comes to focus on those downsides and we're not capable of actually expressing in a clear way what the values of our political system are, why it is so important to have a political system that has both collective self-determination and individual freedom, and how much better people have it in Britain, in Canada, in the United States, than in so many countries in the world that are led by authoritarian leaders, who are not any better, by the way, at dealing with challenges like climate change, but who are much better at repressing their populations, at jailing people for what they're saying, at starting wars like we've seen Russia do in Ukraine recently. Then we shouldn't be surprised that people don't realize the upsides of their system. And what I find in general is that when you have democratic institutions, it's easy to start taking them for granted. You don't credit them for any of the good things they do, but you blame them for all of the bad things in your society. Once you start losing them, or when you don't have them, as we see the brave young people, men and many women in Iran standing up for these rights at the moment, then you really want those back. But of course, at that time, it is incredibly difficult to win those freedoms. So I'm optimistic about people fighting for, for freedom and for democracy in the long run, but I hope that they start doing that before it becomes far too hard. Well, let me just ask Will the direct question. Do you think democracy has served, let's say you're 30 years old, has democracy well served 30-year-olds and younger over the past three decades? Uh, no, I don't think so. And I think, especially in the country that I'm in, the UK, we have had a political system that has served older generations much better than younger generations. If you're in your 20s or 30s here in the UK, you are unlikely to be able to afford to buy a home in the same way that previous generations would have expected to. Uh, you are likely to be delaying the point at which you start a family because of financial costs. Uh, you're likely to uh, be um, burdened. If you've been to university, you're burdened with a marginal tax rates, if you're a higher rate taxpayer, 51% higher than uh, even people on £150,000 a year. So uh, young people, I think, today rightly feel um, pretty peeved about the democratic system and the extent to which it's served them. And I do worry that increasingly young people are turning to more anti-democratic means in order to get their voice heard. So in the UK, for example, only a few weeks ago, we had a number of young people glue themselves to the speaker's chair in the House of Commons in order to protest around climate change. Now, that's a very worthy cause, but that act is the very definition of anti an anti-democratic act. They were quite literally saying, Parliament is not serving us. We need, in, in this case, a people's assembly instead. So the, the, um, the natural consequence of some of this disenchantment, I think, is a movement away from our democratic institutions. Uh, and I think politicians of all sides have unfortunately participated in a, uh, in a trashing of our institutions in this country, whether that's the rule of law, whether that's uh, things like the Office for Budget Responsibility and fiscal discipline in this country. Um, and that has, that has moved uh, young people away from democracy uh, and uh, opened the door to more authoritarian or anti-democratic forms of participation. But Dietlin, here's the part of the equation that I don't understand, which is your students, all of your students, um, th they spend their formative teenage years essentially trying to defy authority, namely their parents. And yet we hear now in these surveys that if democracy is not working for them, they're prepared to take a step towards authoritarianism, which you'd think would be the exact opposite of what they'd want to do because they've been chafing against it for all of their life so far. Can you explain how that makes any sense? Yeah, first of all, I think we should also uh, maybe make a distinction so we cannot just talk about all young people. I mean, I think for some people, the system has worked. Um, but uh, and and students uh, and and their education has, of course, helped them uh, to see some advantages uh, of the democratic system. But I think what happens is that when young people don't see their goals and their, political goals, or climate change or immigration or whatever the issue is from all political sides, don't see it addressed and don't see their own worries addressed uh, in the political system, don't see a political party that reaches out to them. 
uh, that's when a, a leader that potentially is unifying, uh, that is also uh, overcoming the divisions in our society, the polarization in our society, and that maybe is a unifying symbol and that is forging ahead with some interesting ideas that they subscribe to, I think that leader then sounds attractive. And that doesn't necessarily mean that these young people uh, take all of the disadvantages of an authoritarian society uh, as well, or that they want to support that as well. Uh, but the idea of, of a strong leader that can come these divisions, that's, I think, what's interesting to young people. Well, okay, Sam, walk us through this, because I've heard you talk about something called the survival instinct way of thinking, mm -hmm. which you think young people are engaged in, what, and, and, and therefore leads them uh, towards flirting with authoritarianism. What is that? So I think similar to what Will said, um, which I think is a really important point, um, I think it's the case in the UK that a lot of young people, for example, can't afford a home, but it's the case in Canada here too and has been for a while, especially in our major cities. And so you have people's basic needs in, in, in a sense. They have expectations about sort of the milestones of their lives and how that's going to go and then you know, the world sort of changes, the context changes, and those expectations aren't met. So there's there's a degree of stress of, am I gonna be able to afford to have children? I hear young people talk about this all the time. Can I afford a kid? You know, um, what about clean air and water and all of these things? And so this, this uh, climate anxiety is a thing that people are talking about now. So there's this mental health burden to a lot of these things. And, and I agree that it impacts different youth to different degrees, but what happens when you have this stress or you have, you know, mental health anxiety rates rising, depression, is that people resort to sort of this black or white thinking, which is a very simplified way of, of looking at the world. So you have this stress, someone comes along and offers you a solution, as Ditlin was saying, you know, a solution that's simple, you know, ignores a lot of the complexity in the world and tells you, I will fix this thing. And, and in that moment, there are people who will choose to just say, yes, okay, do it. But that's the thing, Will. I mean, do people, okay, they've got grievances with the current democratic uh, system. I, I get that. Uh, everybody understands that. Uh, but to take the next leap and say, therefore, we're going to cozy up to authoritarianism. I mean, do they, do, they, do they not look around the world nowadays? Do they not see what's happening in authoritarian countries? Therefore, I don't, I, I'm having trouble understanding the allure of it all. Maybe you can help me with that. Well, I think the important thing to note is that in the UK, at least, um, we have not seen young people actively joining authoritarian parties and we haven't seen a kind of big surge in uh, authoritarianism amongst young people within the political process but you are starting to see that within some european countries if you look at what happened in the recent french election i think 49 percent of 25 to 34 year olds voted for marine le pen for example uh, you saw that in the recent italian election in the recent swedish election as well um, and yasha has done a huge amount of work specifically on that on that trend towards authoritarianism within europe so he's the expert there but um i think uh, in um Actually, I would say first past the post uh, contested uh, democracies like the UK and the US, you see that much less because there's less ability for authoritarian parties to break through and, and kind of uh, appeal to those grievances, uh, particularly of young people. Um, but that's not to say it can't happen in the future. And I think what we were trying to do with this report is sign a bit, sound a bit of a warning sign, uh, sound just not to the left in, in this country who does win the votes of young people, but also to the right, to the, to the conservatives who are in power, who don't typically think about young people, particularly within the policymaking process, but really need to if they're going to avoid democracy falling into trouble in the future. And I think that's, that's a key question. It's, this isn't just a question for kind of progressive parties who do appeal to young people at the moment. It's also uh, a problem for centre-right parties who believe in democracy as the best way to run a government. Yasha, I wonder how much of this as well is rooted in the fact that, that when I was the age of the people we're talking about tonight, uh, the Cold War was on, and it was pretty obvious what side you wanted to be on, and you knew you didn't want to be on the other side. Uh, we're, the, we're at that, actually just uh, past the 50th anniversary of the Summit Series, the Canada-Soviet hockey series that was the most incredible hockey series of all time. And, and, you know, if you lived through that, you knew what side you wanted to be on. Do you think part of the problem today is that Young people don't know history. They don't know current affairs. Is that an issue? Um, yeah, and again, I think uh, when I look at how civics is taught in many countries, there is an emphasis on uh, the downsides of our political system, on the injustices of today. There's often an emphasis on 
how we can go and become politically active. And both of those things are very good, but should be a part of the civic education of our citizens or of our future citizens. But what we often don't do is to say, here are the upsides of liberal democracy. Here is the, the huge downsides of authoritarian systems. Here's what it looked like to live under communist regimes. Here's what it looked like to live under fascist regimes. Here's what it's like to live today in Venezuela or Russia or other places. Um, but, but I want to pick up on one strand of a conversation. I think Will started to talk about this a little bit. But there was a kind of tacit assumption that perhaps all of us had in parts of a conversation that you know young people are much more progressive than uh, liberal, right? That the reason why young people are frustrated is that they want really radical action on climate change and we're just not delivering enough on that and so on. And I just want to uh, be a little bit cautious about that. So I'm looking here, for example, at a recent Gallup poll in the United States, which shows that among 18 to 29-year-olds, 34% of young people consider themselves liberal, so left-leaning, 41% consider themselves moderate, and 23% consider themselves conservative. So it's only about a third of young people who would actually consider themselves left-leaning according to this poll. And so there's sort of different reasons why different young people are going to be dissatisfied with democracy. Um, there's going to be some left-leaning ones who say, we want more radical action on climate change, we don't like uh, you know, people like Donald Trump being elected in office, etc. There's also going to be uh, conservative young people who feel very differently about what's going on in the society, which helps to explain, as Will was saying, that a lot of young people voted for Marine Le Pen in France in the last elections. And there's a lot of people in the center of politics who probably just think, you know, there's so much rancor and so much polarization and so much hatred. I don't think the system is working for me, but not necessarily because they feel that, um, you know, politics is either too far to the left or too far for, to the right for them but simply because they have a sense there's too much fighting, too much uh, rancor, and not enough delivering on actual issues. Well, Sam, I'm clearly not asking this about you because you are engaged in the issues of the day. You're, you know, apathy is boring. It's your organization. Yeah. You're, you're all about trying to get young people to, to engage more with the democratic institutions of the country. From what I see, when young people want to get involved in public life, for example, it's easy. They volunteer, they're in on the ground floor, they could end up being the chief of staff to a politician a year later. I mean, it's that sometimes it's that easy. Mm. What do you see that maybe I'm not about how impenetrable some of our democratic institutions may be if young people want to engage with them? Is that an issue? Definitely. And I, and I think I just want to touch on something that was brought up before. I think one of the things with democracy that we, we don't tend to separate enough is democracy in and of itself is, is an idea about how our, our, our society is governed. But how that's operationalized is our political system. Those are the rules, right, that we all follow and the, the norms and the practices and all of that. So I think when we think about how civics is taught, for example, in schools, we often focus on these very rigid procedural elements. You know, a bill goes to the House of Commons and then it gets passed in the first reading and blah, blah, blah. And yes, that, that's important to know. But what we don't always talk about is sort of the norms and practices that surround that. And so it can be very intimidating to walk into a political environment if you don't understand who who the real who's really holding the levers of power. Where those discussions happen, and in Canada particularly, I think a lot of our political debate is relegated into caucus environments that are closed. So we don't always see the open debate. We see question period where people might be throwing, you know, barbs back and forth at each other, yeah. but not the same rigor. I, I guess. hear you, but do, do they understand that anybody can join a political party in this country, and most parties don't charge anything for doing it? You can go to conventions, you can get in on the ground floor, you can participate, you can have an impact. They don't see that? I think they know that it's possible. I don't think they know why they would want to do it. And I think that's the interesting mm -hmm. part. How do you... How does power get allocated in those environments? Are you taken seriously? Are you able to have a say? I think young people will put their energy because they care so deeply about issues. And I think Yasha's right, those issues are varied and there's no monolith among youth. But I really think that it's important that we remember that young people will show up and put their energy where they feel their energy is making a difference. And if they don't feel that way, then they won't. And that's why voter turnout goes up and down when it comes to young people and has been trending down for so long. I think they don't see the purpose of it. So they'll find other channels in other ways, and that's what we're talking about here today, to, to see their priorities addressed. And if the political system that we have currently is not addressing those issues, then they will look to other places. They will, you know, glue themselves to the speaker's chair. or their, and, that, and that's an, an expression of frustration around their ability to have an impact in our political system when we say that democracy is there to um, 
you know, represent all of us, and some are better represented than mm. others. Deedlin, can I ask you about your students? I mean, you're, you're teaching poli-sci students, so we have to assume off the top that they're interested in these kinds of issues. Do they feel that the political institutions of this country are so impenetrable right now that there's no point in engaging? Yes, I would agree uh, with uh, what, what has been said before, that uh, there is a doubt that political institutions will actually react to them. And uh, there is even research uh, showing and confirming this. Uh, so when political parties, for example, uh, reach out and experiments uh, explicitly make a stance for young people, they are being punished by other voters. So it is politically risky even parties to reach out to young people. There needs to be a political solution that is uh, much more universal and that uh, kind of cuts across party politics as we see it right now uh, in order to address this fundamental problem. Uh, but because of that, uh, as Samantha said, there is a reaction of, of young people. They don't expect uh, political actors uh, to react to them. So they kind of withdraw into a different world. And what we see now is also uh, that uh, the young people uh, don't know uh, all the details about living in an authoritarian society, but they also don't know all the aspects of what makes a democracy uh, work. And so, for example, when we ask democratic knowledge questions, not procedural ones, but just kind of, you know, what is this situation democratic or not? How do you feel about it? Uh, younger people are much less likely to judge or evaluate the situation correctly as either democratic or undemocratic. So the, the lack of democratic knowledge even is also very blatant. And so we see even uh, kind of a, an interesting conundrum uh, that people, for example, who think that democracy is important also support a very strong leader who can do away with elections and so on. So we, we feel actually that there is uh, a lack of knowledge of the details of the democratic process and how young people can really engage. Yasha, is it worse in America because the country is so much more polarized than we are in Canada? Yeah, I think so. I mean, in Canada, you have a political system that Canadians like to complain about for good reason. Everybody complains about their own political system. But I do think that there is a sense that, uh, you know, there are two or three sane choices uh, at each election. Uh, that uh, elections have consequences, sometimes there's a change of government, and then that new government can actually uh, pursue different policies. And then at the next election, voters get a chance to say, hey, did the government do a good job, or did I actually not like it very much, and perhaps I'll go back to voting for the other set of parties that are currently in opposition. In the United States, there is both a sense that the polarization is, is extreme, uh, that often uh, you know, very motivated activist bases control the political parties so that many people feel that they don't particularly like either political party. And then when a party does win a presidential election, for example, there are so many veto powers, so many roadblocks uh, to actually passing reform and legislation that it doesn't seem to have very much impact on the kinds of policies that the government pursues and the kind of laws that are on the book. And so that mixture between stasis and anger, that mixture between nothing really changes, nothing really happens, that people are shouting all of the time and these people I really dislike are on the television every day and they're in power, uh, that's a really unhealthy mix. And I think it does create a deeper cynicism about democracy among young people in the United States, but also among older people in the United States. Well, OK, but Will, how much of this is just out and out complacency? They assume democracy has been here yesterday, it's here today, it'll be here tomorrow, and they don't feel they really need to engage or participate in order to ensure its continuation. I think the interesting question is the extent to which this is actually cultural and part of a much broader trend amongst young people. So in our study that you cited, Steve, we um, we looked at trends of things like volunteering and civic participation amongst young people. And we know that across many generations um, or many years, uh, young people have become less and less likely to do those things. And if you if you look back through the history of democracy, people like uh, de Tocqueville and others called civic participation, civic association, the mother science of democracy. That was the thing that kept it working. People participating in, uh, in broader civic society. They might be a member of a trade union. They might be a member of a friendly society back in the day. Um, and a lot of that kind of infrastructure and association has fallen away. And young people today are increasingly isolated. They're much less likely 
likely to have close friends. They're much less likely to participate in some of those groups. They're much less likely to volunteer in their community. And I do think that that has quite a profound impact on democracy. That kind of undermines some of that cultural uh, support for collective bargaining, as Yasha was talking about earlier. And so I'm not sure it is complacency. I think it's a broader cultural shift. And the interesting thing about that is if that is true, then those things are possible to reverse. It is possible to find new ways to engage young people in volunteering and civic participation. It is possible to uh, introduce new forms of civic service on a national scale, as you have in some countries. Um, and so I do think that there is an interesting policy question, uh, but I'm not sure it's complacency. I think it's a broader cultural shift. Well, you've nicely led us to where we need to go next, which is, okay, if we want to get more young people engaged and get them turned on to democracy, Dietland, let's have some ideas. What do we need to do? Well, I think uh, one idea uh, would be to have more direct contacts to people who live in authoritarian societies and to have them tell uh, our young people uh, what kind of the limitations and constraints are and what kind of sacrifices people make living in such societies and uh, therefore exchange about the potential values of a democratic system. I think that was, for example, a missed opportunity in a united Germany back then when we could have had more direct exchanges of people living in the East coming to the West uh, and the other way around to tell each other about each other's societies. That was not done. Um, there, there was a focus on, on very fast uh, unification, for example. So that was a missed opportunity. And I think today that we don't have the kind of divisions of the Cold War where we get more direct information about the other side uh, of the wall, so to say, um, you know, we need this kind of input uh, of these societies. Um, and uh, so, so that could be arranged in uh, civics lessons in schools and organizations uh, and so on. I mean, that would be one idea. Uh, the other would be to, um, to make civic lessons much more interesting and hands-on, to actually have young people be responsible for a certain part of a city's budget, for example, mm -hmm. and to, to be able to decide together uh, what to do with this budget uh, according to their wishes so they can follow through with their uh, democratic ideas and their conversations, their dialogue with the other side uh, and, and so on. So to have a hands-on civics lessons is much more important than uh, the actual procedural aspects uh, of a democracy that you learn more theoretically. I love these ideas. Let's keep going. Sam, what else? <laughs> I mean, I think there's a lot of work to be done at the local level. I know we've all seen sort of the stats around the voter turnout in the municipal elections that just happened in BC, and obviously there are municipal elections happening um, on Monday here in Ontario. And I think that there's a big like there's a big loss that's happening at that level where one, we don't seem to have the same kind of media coverage locally, especially in smaller communities. So people don't really know what's happening in their city halls, but there's so much work that can be done at that level to build trust. Young people tend to trust municipal governments better, more so than other levels of government. Um, and there's work that can be done there to the point around volunteering, creating local networks where people can have dialogue around things happening in their community, discuss solutions, and then building power at that level, I think is one way that's appealing to young people, um, particularly around issues that they do care about, and also can allow them to have a bit more of that feedback loop around actually making an impact, because it's so much easier to sort of set up around these nested goals and incrementally work towards change than expecting to go from zero to eradicating climate change, for example. Mm. And really doing that experiential learning and community learning and mentorship, I think, from what we've seen in our programs, gives people so much more confidence in their ability to have an impact at all, but also gives a sense of belonging and breaks down some of the social isolation that we haven't even really touched on, but is impacting so many young people, particularly after the pandemic, right. where we do see this this loss of, of connection with the people who live around us. Um, and that lack of sense of belonging is also leading people into spaces where they do find that belonging. Um, but the narratives that come along with that, the worldviews that come along with that, and in some cases, the shared outright lies uh, about our broader society that come with that is, is the trade-off that we're seeing for some young people. Yasha Monk, what else? Well, I think we have a lot of great ideas on the table. I think Sam is absolutely right about the need for concrete ways to get engaged locally. I think Will is right about the need for a form of national service uh, where people can choose to spend a year or six months or perhaps two years really engaging in communities. I think Rosalind made important points about the need for 
more and better civics lessons and, and for us to really communicate what it's like to live in authoritarian systems. By the way, one of the things I've been struck by is how little coverage there's been in Western media of these incredibly courageous protests in Iran. I don't understand why this incredible, inspiring, important story is hardly being talked about. That is important in itself, and it also would be an important moment for people to learn about that. But I want to say something slightly paradoxical, which is that I fear that when politicians and institutions and so on say, hey, we worry about how unengaged young people are, we should give them more of a voice, we should listen to them more, what we often do is a mistake, which is they then uh, assume that those young people who are really engaged in a political process, who are really uh, activists, speak for the rest of their generation. But nearly by definition, that is not the case, because they are actually part of a minority of young people who are super engaged in a political system, and often their views are systematically different from others. So paradoxically, we need to create more space for young people to engage in a political system, but we should also be aware of thinking, hey, those people who are engaging, who are really activists, are actually representative of public opinion among young people more broadly. Hmm. Okay, we got a minute and change to go here. Will, I want to give it to you, because, um, well, look, as you get older, you kind of turn on to some ideas that when you were a kid, you might have thought were a bit crazy. Uh, you start to like jazz. You start to like classical music. Is it possible that as these 18 to 30-year-olds get older, they'll just kind of turn on to democracy by virtue of getting older? So it is possible, but what we know from all of the data is that they are becoming more democratic more slowly, perhaps, than other uh, generations before them. Uh, and that if you look at different points in time, younger generations are significantly more likely to be anti-democratic than previous generations at the age at which they are. So this is this does seem to be a uh, um, uh, a cohort effect rather than an age effect, to use the technical terminology, i.e. these cohorts are structurally more likely to be anti-democratic and that is unlikely to change dramatically as they age. Um, but it, just in terms of what we can do about it, just very quickly, I very strongly agree with Yasha around the idea of national civic service. Um, but just to pick up on one thing that Sam said, I think local journalism is crucial here and much mm. better journalism to reach um, young people. And I think that's one of the biggest shifts that we've seen over the last few decades as social media and, and kind of internet journalism has, has taken hold. That kind of authoritative local journalism and that local democratic voice has been lost. And I think that is one of the biggest problems in many Western democracies and it's common across all of these countries that we've talked about tonight. Some wonderful, wonderful ideas here. I want to thank the four of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views. Will Tanner, Yasha Monk, Dietlin Stoll, Samantha Roosh. Would you say hi to your dad for me, please, hi, Samantha? Will. Who's one of the great hockey play-by-play -play <laughs> guys, Ron Roosh. Canada Cups, Olympic Games, National Hockey League. Anyway, I was a big fan of his back in the day. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody, very much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.